Okay, folks, welcome to the uh, book festival. I'm very glad to see you. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping announcements. Uh, if you're hungry after this talk, there's food over there. Uh, Jessica will be signing books in the book tent over there. Uh, if you feel like contributing to the uh, book festival, uh, that would be much appreciated. I'm not actually sure who you give the money to. <laughs> 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 well, right. We could we could put it out for bid as to who gets the who gets to hold the money. <laughs> uh, but and uh, after it, we're going to organize this talk in a way that there'll be time for uh, audience questions and answers with about roughly ten minutes to go. So as you know, you're here to hear Jessica Harris. She'll be uh, interviewed by Don Davis, and introduced by Don Davis. D Don Davis is the vice president and publisher of Thirty Seven Inc. So Don, welcome, and uh, take it away. Hello. Can you hear me? Is it turned on? He promised me it would be turned on. So first of all, I want to thank everyone for coming out. I'm always astonished that on a beautiful day where there's so many other things to do that people choose to honor and support authors and books. So thanks all of you for that. And with that, we're just going to get into the interview. Um, Jessica Harris, you probably have her cookbooks on your shelf. She's written over 12 of them and she's done so many other things, which we'll talk about. Um, but we're here today to celebrate her as a memoirist, which her book can be described and really kind of broken down into two parts. 
On the one hand, it tells the story of your great love for a man named Sam Floyd, a powerhouse intellect who collected an astonishingly, an astonishingly uh, accomplished group of friends, uh, Maya Angelou, James Baldwin, Toni Morrison, uh, Nina Simone, etc. And the second part of the book is really about the ebbs and flows of your friendship with Maya Angelou. Can you read us just a little bit from the book to start? Can everybody hear? Yeah, oh, yes, you can. <laughs> okay. <coughs> well, this is the prologue. So since, um, you know, in the immortal words of Alice in Wonderland, start at the beginning, go on to the end, and then stop. This is the prologue. It is the very beginning of the book. My man is black, golden, amber, changing, warm mouths of brandy, fiend. So opens Maya Angelou's poem to a man. If I'd read those lines back in the 1970s, this story would never have happened. <laughs> Instead, ignorant, trusting, believing in love, and woefully too young, I raced in. I've been rereading Angelou's poetry recently because her passing has brought memories of my youth vividly back. I've been known to say that I am the zealot of the second half of the 20th century because it has been my great good fortune to turn up in multiple special spots. I lived and studied in Paris when Leal was still going strong and the buildings were gray. I've supped with Semben in Senghor, Senegal, and I've danced in the Candomblé ring in Georges Amado's Bahia. However, the real reason that I identify with the Woody Allen character is that it was my privilege to spend a part of my youth with Maya Angelou, James Baldwin, and their circles of friends as they were becoming icons of 20th century America. Their joy in one another, the fierceness of their intellectual pursuits, and their absolute dedication to civil rights and the righting of civil wrongs of all sorts made their names hallmarks of honesty and totems for truth. I'm not central to the story, although I have lived it. Rather, it is an extraordinary circle of friends who came together, lived outrageously, loved abundantly, laughed uproariously, and savored life while they created work that would come to define the era. That they knew one another was interesting. That they partied together, savored one another's company, encouraged one another's endeavors, celebrated one another's achievements, and mourned one another's losses is extraordinary. The tale is also the tale of a city, New York City. Its neighborhoods and its vibrant life is also a character, for no other place in the world could have spawned and celebrated their lives with such intensity. Paris had La Belle Époque, the 1920s, and the existentialist 1950s. London had the swing and singles, and New York City, swing and 60s, sorry about that, and the swing and singles, but that's another book. <laughs> And New York City, in the early 1970s, was the hub of the universe city. It was the city in the throes of a major transition, when restaurants could offer a glimpse of the fading world of cafe society, or bubble with the excitement of the new era that was being created. And the clubs that existed for every possible social stripe throbbed nightly with the excesses of the sexual and moral revolution that had been ushered in in the 1960s. It is with good reason that we are in the Stonewall tent. Life was lived in widescreen technicolor in ways that had never before existed. It was the city before AIDS and economic downturns made it a very different place. Memory has muted some of the vibrancy of the colors and the dates fade into a continuum but the vitality of the friendships, the commitment to activism, and the joie de vivre of those heady days remain as palpable as the intertwined connective tissue of the lives that were lived then. Thank you. So you, as I mentioned, uh, have written 12 cookbooks. You started out as a book review, uh, a book reviewer. You've d been a theater critic, a travel writer. And now you turn to memoir, and you have to be so vulnerable. We were talking about this backstage. Before, if you did a, a reading or a presentation, people would ask you about a recipe. Now they're really probing some of your deep, 
secrets and you've you've revealed them and shared them talk to us about why a memoir and and what the process is like to kind of dig through some of those memories well it's it's you know i'm used to one cup two tablespoons and you know i can tell you a little bit about the history of where this that or the other is from but now people want to know well, how would you feel about your father <laughs> really um you know what did you feel at this moment it's like uh, not your business. But you don't get to say that is part of it. Um, memoir came, I guess, as a result of memory. The genesis of the book was an article that I was asked to write for the New York Times. And uh, after Maya died, a friend from the Times in the food section who knew I knew her said, did you ever cook with her? And I said, oh, yes. And she said, well, I'd love for you to write an article about that. And so I did. Um, then maybe about three months later, I was having dinner with my editor. One of the things that I love about publishing that still exists, not to the degree that it used to when I got started in it, is all those lunches and dinners. So I was having dinner with my editor, who said, uh, we were talking about what the next book might be. And we had gone through X and Y and P and Q. And she finally looked at me and said, are you sure that's all? And I said, I don't know. Um, have you read the book or have you read the article about Maya Angelou that I just turned in? And she said, no, but I think that's your next book. And so that's how memoir happened. That's how I became a memoirist, if you will, totally by accident, which is how I became most of those other things that you listed, <laughs> totally by accident. I love that. I see a couple of my authors in the audience. I think they now want me to take them to dinner to come up with the next Oh, book absolutely. <laughs> she said that was a couple years Called ago. Called expense <laughs> account. Mm -hmm. At least once a year. Once a year. And celebrations. Absolutely. So you write about your parents being aspirational. And I'm going to just read a clip. It says, uh, I was their major chess piece on the board game that was the American dream. They scrimped to take you on a grand tour of Europe. Lincoln Center was visited as often as church. The family acquired a summer house on Martha's Vineyard to better slip their daughter's canoe into the entire, into the elite currents of the African-American dream and culture. What's your connection to this island now? Is it still uh, an aspirational place for Americans in general and black Americans in particular? Oh goodness, well I think so much has changed. First of all, my parents actually bought the house that I still live in, in 1957. Okay, so I can claim deep roots here. Um, and they may have bought it in 56. I know our first summer here was 57. What the island was then was very different. It was, a, um, it was as I like to say, BC, before Chappaquiddick. Okay, <laughs> Chappaquiddick started changing the island. The island was a place that some people knew about, but not everybody. Chappaquiddick put it in, you know, headlines in, um, you know, sort of full screen. And then after that, Clinton's, and then after that, this whole rush. Um, when we moved to the island, most people, African-American people, lived in one place, the Highlands. The Highlands being the back part uh, from New York Avenue to sort of Midway East Chop, if you're not familiar with them. Uh, Eons ago, 19th century, everybody knows the Methodist campgrounds. In the Highlands, there was a Baptist campground, and you can go still see the pentimento of the circle that was around it. The tabernacle is no longer there, but there was a Baptist campground on one side, a Methodist campground on the other side, and New York Avenue was known as Jordan. So you talk about crossing Jordan, okay? So all of that part of history, when we moved in at that point in the 50s, people were just beginning to move out of the highlands into the center of town. And okay, don't y'all come all at once, but I live on Tuckernuck, right opposite the tennis courts. Now, then there were literally two tennis courts. They have subsequently made my life and summer live in hell because they put in the basketball court. Noise, noise, noise. They put in the kids park. Hi, outside voices at 7 a.m. Um, but that park was basically a center. And if you look at what is now the Copeland Historic District, it was built around these series of, if you will, lungs of airspaces. Um, we just were moving 
in we being African Americans just moving into that part of town. My childhood on the island, and I've spent 61 summers here, the African American community went from Tuckernock beyond, there were people living on Nashawena, a few, but they were living next to and with year-round people for the most part. From there to Ocean Park, not that many African American families on Ocean Park, from Circuit to the water. Now if you visit that area nowadays, it has, con it has changed. It has changed again, complexion has changed. There are still pockets of people, there are people who come for X number of weeks or Y number of weeks. There are people who know each other, there are people who've grown up with each other, there are people who are multi-generational. So it's, it's a different vineyard. It's not a worse vineyard, it's just, you know, plus ça change, plus ça reste la même chose in a way. The more things change, the more they stay the same. But now when somebody says, I live in Chilmark, it's like, oh, oh, okay, new people, new people, <laughs> you know, because that didn't happen. It just didn't happen. Yeah. One of my, I'm going to, uh, one of my personally favorite parts of the book is when you talk about James Baldwin. Um, you're in the south of France. Sam has invited you to meet his best friend, who's James Baldwin. And uh, at this point, he's holding court and in town. Everyone knows him. He makes popcorn one night, takes you to the basement, and sa starts reading. Can you, uh, he starts reading from what will become one of his novels. And uh, tell us what that was like to have James Baldwin read from a work in progress and then ask you your opinion about it. Uh, in a word, terrifying. <laughs> um, Baldwin's house. I, um, I didn't read the entire prologue. The, I got to know James Baldwin and Maya Angelou through a friend of theirs, someone that they deeply cared about, dearly loved, named Samuel Clemens Floyd III, who uh, taught with me at Queens College, where I taught then and still teach now, lo these never mind how many years later. Um, as a result of my deepening relationship with Sam, in the summer of, I think it is, 73, 74, and I don't remember, I'd have to consult the book for the date, he says, come, we're going to go spend a week in saint paul de -Vence. So saint paul de -Vence is where Baldwin had his house. And Baldwin's house was interesting because we think of it as a house. It was actually, if you will, a property. There was a gatehouse. Not necessarily a vineyard gatehouse, but there was a house on the road. And then beyond that house, there was another house inside. A gentleman named Bernard Hassel lived in the house on the road. Baldwin lived in the house on the interior, and his house had two levels. It was built on a hill, so there was a downstairs and an upstairs. Baldwin actually lived in the downstairs. He lived in the downstairs zone. He used to refer to it as his torture chamber. So he would decamp down to the torture chamber, and during the day you'd hear, it was, you know, I'm BT before typewriters. I mean, before C, BC again, before computers. So he would type, and you could hear, you know, typewriters, for those of you who are post type, post computer, um, typewriters make noise. So you would hear the noise, and it was a steady noise. And if it stopped, everybody was aware that it had stopped. He would come up for lunch, he would come up for dinner. One night, he made popcorn. And he made popcorn the old-fashioned way. He put the oil in a heavy pot, put the popcorn in it, shook the pot, the corn pops, and invited us all downstairs. It was one of two times that I saw downstairs, because it was really sanctum sanctorum. So we go, we arrange ourselves around Baldwin, who was sitting on a chair, I think I'm on the floor, at his feet, gazing adoringly, I'm sure, upward. And he reads the entire manuscript of what would become if Beale Street could talk. And he starts it and he reads it. And now if Beale Street could talk is a slightly fictionalized version of the Tony Maynard case. Tony Maynard was a cause célèbre, you can read about him in New York at in the 70s. Um, but he's looking dead at me as he's reading this. 
Now, I'm all of about 24, 25, and so I'm sort of sitting there going, mm, okay, <sighs> pretty much. And at the end of the reading, he says, what'd you think? How, how did you like it? And I'm like, I don't know what, what do you say to James Baldwin? He's asking you, how did you like something? It's like, I loved it. It was wonderful. I thought that, that. Here's what I refer to now as Jessica stories. This is another Jessica story. About three days, four days later, still during that same week, Toni Morrison comes to spend time with Baldwin. The sleeping arrangements get rejigged. I get to say I was roommate with Toni Morrison. Um, and he makes popcorn again. He invites us downstairs again. And he rereads the entire manuscript again. This time looking at Toni Morrison. Now, I didn't know this until maybe a couple of weeks ago. I'm still in touch with Baldwin's sister-in-law, the widow of his uh, brother, Lover, and the mother of that nephew that the letter to a nephew is written. Um, and she said, oh, sure, sure, I got that, I got that. I didn't know you didn't know. Tony and Jimmy, as I learned to call him, had a relationship where she could comment. And so afterwards, she looks at him and speaks to him as an editor. She says, yes, you got it. You absolutely got it. It makes sense. It works. If Beale Street Could Talk is written from the point of view of Trish, a 24-year-old black woman. It's what I was. He was asking me, did I get the voice right? He was asking me, had I, had I heard anything? Did it make sense? Was there anything shocking? I didn't get it. Tony got it. And when Tony got it, I got it. So I've got it for the rest of my life, but I didn't have it then. Well, I think one of the things that's so interesting is that you were a good 15 to 20 years younger than so many of these people who were hitting their stride. You were clearly uh, bright and on a career path of your own that would be striking, but you must have had a kind of inferiority complex to be around these giants, these luminaries. Um, and at the same time, maybe you even had the kind of imposter syndrome, do I belong here? Can I comment on, on Baldwin? So when did you kind of possess your own, when did you know that yeah, I belong here, I earn a seat at the table, um, I'm, if not their equal, I'm, I'm going to be their equal one day. Did you ever get that confidence? Uh, no, that would come maybe tomorrow, I have no <laughs> idea. No, it ain't there yet. It ain't there yet. I, um, I, uh, the imposter syndrome possibly, I just, um, I've noticed a new kind of hashtag on uh, Instagram or Twitter that is bow down. Okay. I spent my entire time bowing down and should have. Right. And should have. Um, I didn't belong at the table. I mean, they were extremely generous. When my first cookbook came out, and ironically, it was one of my last times with Sam. Uh, I remember dedicating it to him and saying in the written dedication, you knew I had it in me before I knew I had it in me. Right. And I think there may have been a part of that that they knew that I didn't know. Right. But, um, but I really didn't know it. So I know that... Uh, Maya Angelou and Toni Morrison, they can all be so intimidating, but you spent many a warm moment with them as well. There were times that you cooked with Maya, that you cooked uh, side by side, that you were a guest at her home in Sonoma where she laid out just uh, terrific amounts of food that were all delicious. Would you read us a passage uh, where you have an encounter with Maya? Oh, okay, let's see. I'm going to have to flip some pages because I was going to read about Jimmy, but I'll find Maya if I can because I need to have this thing indexed for myself, but don't. So I'll blather at you for a minute while I'm looking for pages. But um, the thing that was so interesting about... You, you can read from... No, I'm going to read something altogether different because I suspect that there is some New York... Oh, no, here it is. Got it. God sometimes saves you from stupidness. Um, I do not remember exactly when I met Maya. 
just one day, she was there in a whirlwind of activity. My first remembrance of her is at a dinner at the Paparazzi, an East Side Manhattan eatery run by Jerry Purcell, the man Maya credits with being her patron and giving her enough money to keep her afloat while she was writing. While she was writing, I know why the caged bird sings. Purcell, who was a personal manager and a record television and concert producer, was known to those outside of show business ranks as the husband of Monique Van Voren, the pneumatic Brazil Belgian actress. Through Maya, Sam knew Purcell, and we had dinner at the restaurant occasionally. Paparazzi was aptly named. It was a fishbowl restaurant with huge plate glass windows through which the diners could be seen as they tucked into their pastas. On one occasion, Maya arrived and joined us. She was imperially tall and wore her fame like a royal mantle. By then, I had read Caged Bird and was already in awe of her. She breezed into the restaurant like a whirlwind, bringing more animated conversation, higher intensity, and the tension that comes with knowing that you are at the center of a vortex. It was palpable. The air had changed. Even though this was an informal gathering of friends, Maya arrived with all the pomp of Cleopatra descending the Nile. There were kisses all round, introductions to those not known, raucous remembrances of those not in attendance, and an order of another round of drinks with which to salute the occasion. Maya had married Paul Dufeu in 1973 tall and rangy, with a finely honed sense of dry British humor. He was charming, fierce, and extremely comfortable in his masculinity. A self-proclaimed hod carrier, he was a carpenter and a bricklayer by trade, and had been ma not only married to feminist Germaine Greer of female eunuch fame, but had posed nude in the British Playgirl magazine displaying his endowments to the world. And oh yes, he was white, which in itself was scandaleux. None of it mattered to them or to anyone else. Maya was in love. They had their own private jokes and their conspiratorial smiles. They showed up at one New York evening for dinner at Paparazzi wearing matching mink-lined denim jackets and giggling about how ridiculous they were. <laughs> Conspiratorially close, they were given to raucous behavior. Evenings might end with rousing renditions of Knees Up Mother Brown while dancing in lockstep down the streets or in full-throated singing of other classic pub songs like I'm Ennery the Eighth I Am. Paul was used to smart women who were, as the saying went, heavy in the head. When he was reportedly told that Maya was a very important woman in the world, his reply was, I can carry the weight. And for a while, he could. If he could handle Greer's notoriety, clearly he'd be able to take the weight of Maya's increasing fame. We're going to do a quick round of word association and then we'll open it up for questions. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to say a <coughs> word and you tell me the first thing that comes to mind. Baldwin. Generous. Black arts movement. Extraordinary. Martha's Vineyard. Home. The village in the 70s. Wish I could go back, not one <laughs> word. Phenomenal. Club 81. Missed. Would you, do you want to explain what Club 81 was? Club, uh, Sam lived at 81 Horatio Street in the West Village. It was the building in which Baldwin also lived. Uh, you can see 81 now in the village because it's got a plaque that uh, details that Baldwin lived there. The great irony is it is no longer an apartment building. It has been purchased and transformed into a private house again. Ironically, the house belongs to the Hearst family, so I think that's kind of wacko, full circle stuff. I have more questions, but I'd love to open it up to you who came here on this beautiful day. Does anyone have any questions? Don't be shy. Okay. No, oh. no I, I do. I, I listen to you say you, that you've 
you've been coming here 61 years, and I understand you say it's home, but sometimes you even get tired of going home. So what, what is the draw? What, aside from it saying, is, oh, I'm going home, what is it? Okay. What, what's the magic to hear? The magic to hear, which does sometimes get on my nerves, <laughs> is um, I have no mother, no father, no husband, no kids, no siblings. It's a family house. It's filled with memory. I will always come here until I can't come here. Okay. Anyone else? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> okay, for you who don't know, you've all been to restaurants where you've had Anson Mills grits. That's Anson Mills, <laughs> Glenn Roberts. A lot of, a lot of, woo, a lot of people call me Anson Mills. Uh, <laughs> uh, just in case, uh, we're friends. So yeah. that's where At that old God came from. At least until he asks the question. Yes, the, the, que yeah, the old God is, uh, what does he have on me today? Uh, the French Senegalese uh, impressions and how they informed uh, your later life and if they do or do not entwine with the beautiful book you just released. Well, yes. Um, he knows a little bit more about me than, than you probably do. Uh, I, um, my junior year I spent in France. I do allude to that when I say I lived in Paris. I have a licences lettre from the Université de Nancy, and I am a card-carrying, dyed-in-the-wool, they-will-carry-me-out Francophile. Um, what happened after this period and while it is called a memoir it is really the working title was not my soul looks back the working title of this book was a moment in time because that was what it really was it's a moment in time but that moment in time is followed by multiple other moments in time one of which involved my love affair ongoing with francophone africa my doctoral dissertation is on the French-speaking theater of Senegal, and I've been going to Senegal. You've heard the BC before computers. You've heard the BC before whatever else it was. This is the BR, before roots. So I went to uh, Senegal for the first time in 72, before I was writing cookbooks, before I was doing any of that kind of thing. And the thing about Senegal that just struck me was it, too, felt like home. Um, and it felt like home culturally, but it also felt like home culinarily. And one of the reasons that it felt like home is because I, like many African Americans I know, have a preference for rice over potatoes. And Senegal is a country where people who were in the Peace Corps used to jokingly say that they'd have to change the Lord's Prayer to read, give us this day our daily rice because it is a country that is rice growing and one of the wonderful things that that Anson Mills is doing and that I have sort of worked with them on and that hope to continue to work with them on and I'm fascinated to just see how it unspools is looking at African rice Africa has its own rice we all think of rice we think of Asia Oriza sativa but Oriza glaberima is native to the African continent and so to begin to look at that, the unspooling of that, the unspooling of discoveries and how people are learning about that rice, the connections that that rice and other rices and rice growing methods have particularly with the Carolinas is incredible work. And some of it is actually allowing me to connect all of my points. So I get to collect, connect uh, Carolina and um, and New Orleans, which is also a rice growing area, with Western Africa on the plate. With the island, because some of the rice cultivars are being grown out on the rice, on the island, on the rock. We might have time for one last question. Adrian, good morning. Thank you, guys. Um, Jessica, uh, speaking of your Francophilia, what uh, uh, your trip to uh, to France to to Saint Paul de Vence to go see Jimmy Baldwin was that your first time there? Did the romance of that impact what later would become a re you know the relationship with France? How did that factor in? Oh God, no, 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 no. I um okay. 
deeper dive. Um, I am the first non-UN child to go to the United Nations International School. I went with Ralph Bunch's kids. Um, not the first black child, the first non-UN connected child. So I grew up with friends from all over the world. Back in that day, um, the kids with whom I went to school, who were middle and upper level diplomats, used to go home for what they called home leave. And it was like, I need to be going on home leave. You know, take me, I wanna go to Poland for the weekend. Where are we going? I need, my parents sort of looked, it's like, okay. They, they always sort of looked at me with this, oh my God, what have we spawned thing. Um, so the first trip we took out of the country, I was probably about six, was to Montreal, French speaking. But I did, uh, we took the Grand Tour uh, in 63 to Europe. Um, my first trip to Paris. In 60, I guess it must have been 66, 67, I did a junior year in Paris, lived with a French family, um, and sort of lived there for a year after I graduated from college, so 68, 69, I did that licences lettres in Nancy, France. Uh, the galloping Francophilia has gone on for decades at this point, way too long, yeah. One more question, up front. Somebody I don't know. <laughs> Hi, Jessica. Hi. Um, who do you think are some of the important writers today? Some of the people who are taking See, I should have asked you your question. Yeah, yeah. See, see, you should have done that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. There are so many. There are so many, and I'm going to blank on names, so rather than blank on names, I would just say what almost has greater import to me than who they may be is that y'all should be reading them, whoever they are. So, you know, independent bookseller, I'm one of those people. Um, I don't like recommending reading because I read everything. I, I, read, I, I am reading probably about five books now, a range from something called White Trash to a very trashy, cozy murder mystery, and everything in the gamut between. I just want people to read. I remember at some point, um, my mother was trying to censor my reading when I was about 12, and I was one of those wise-ass children. So sh I was reading Solomon and She, but a little dirty book. And she sort of said, mm, Jessica, you should be reading that. I said, well, I can read it in the Bible. And she <laughs> shut up, back down, and let me read whatever I wanted to read. But the bottom line is, I think, Read, 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 read. I tell my students, I don't care. I'm, I'm a fan of graphic novels. I've just read March, which I think is astounding. I'm trying to decide whether or not I'm gonna teach it. Um, such a range, such a range. Uh, picture books, I love picture books. Um, vintage Black Glamour. I know those aren't the writers you're thinking about, okay? But I think that everyone should just read. Decide what your genre is. I'll it. point out that there are two writers that I know of. I know that there are more, but I see Dolan Perkins Valdez in the back who wrote a wonderful novel called Winch and Erica Armstrong Dunbar, a historian who just wrote a book called Never Caught about George Washington is also in the audience. Both of which I There's so many people read. here <laughs> on the grounds today. We have uh, filmmakers amongst us. We have so many. Uh, Adrian is a, writes about art. There's so many people here. I'm sure the ground's all over and Bunch of Grapes has a fa fabulous recommended read section as well. Talk to booksellers. Um, I think that's all we have time for. I have one question. <laughs> Your African rice, can you get it Can you get it? I don't think it's being merchandised yet, but okay. soon come. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So that, that, that was that was really fabulous. I, I, I just, I can't help but saying this. And there's also academics who write books. Three people read my books. Three. <laughs> Maybe four. Uh, Jessica will be signing books in the book tent back there. Uh, that was really terrific. Thank you very much. That was great. Thank you.